Th thank you very much. Is this thing working okay? Good. So I have uh, taken the laser way out. I'm going to show you a pile of photographs and talk about them and kind of take you through what we do a bit. Um, so what is, what is uh, fox hunting or riding to hounds as it's commonly called or as most of us in that little world call it, just plain hunting. So you can probably define it as um, a pack of hounds chasing a coyote followed by a bunch of people on horseback who um, follow the hounds and that's cross country. So that's really what, what a fox hunting or riding to hounds is about. Um, <clears throat> the history of it goes way, way, way back, and there are, um, there are documents around that show that riding and using hounds to hunt goes way back to um, uh, the ancient Greek times in two or 300 BC, and it's, it's been going continually since then, so there's a fair bit of history there. I'm not going to bore you with it, but it's been around a long time. It's evolved into what it is today, and so I'll show you kind of what we do, and, and, but that's where it started, way, way, way back. Um, in North America, the settlers who came here from Europe and England particularly uh, brought hounds with them and tried to hunt here the way they did back home. And um, the earliest one, earliest club formed in Canada was in Montreal in uh, 1825, and then in 1843, the Toronto hunt was founded, and that's really for purposes of our sort of general geographic area where hunting started. Both our hunt, the Eglinton and Caledon one, and our neighboring hunt, the Toronto North York, both come from that Toronto hunt originally. Ours, there's no hunting there. Um, I think if I get this thing to... Can I go back to the PowerPoint now? Yeah, that's what we can, thanks. Great, so this is, this is a photo of the Toronto hunt in uh, 1844. And you can see the riders and the hounds, and uh, they've gathered to for a day. So, and the same thing happens today, except not in the same location. This is a picture from uh, 1904, and that's at Bathurst and St. Clair, for those of you who know the... So it's, it's, obviously hunting's moved a long way north since then, because you need open country for what we do. You can't hunt where there's development. Um, <clears throat> So I'm going to take us through uh, what I call a typical day. Um, <clears throat> most people who come out with us uh, come out for the riding. So there's an old saying that you either hunt to ride or ride to hunt. And most people hunt to ride. In fact, 98% of them do. And then there's 2%, including me, who go out because they like the hounds and the, and the hunting side of things. So uh, twice a week, during our, our season, which runs from um, roughly the middle of August to about the end of November, depending on the weather. We gather at a predetermined location, usually somebody's farm. The huntsman will have got up early and um, will have loaded the hounds on the hunt truck. This is the hunt truck you're looking at. He will bring somewhere between 25 and 35 hounds with him. He drives them up to the meet <coughs> and um, Basically, when things are ready, lets them out. Here you can see the hounds coming out. These are, these are the dog breed foxhound, and there are English and crossbreak foxhounds there. You'll see that they have collars around their necks and numbers. That's, those are tracking collars so that if they get lost, we can find them. The riders, in the meantime, have all parked their trailers somewhere else close by there, and everybody un unships, gets on their horses, gets, gets ready to go, and then there's a place we meet, this person's house we met at, so we're on their front lawn here. So we've got the riders behind, the huntsman in front with the hounds, <clears throat> and there's usually a few speeches, and if you can stay awake through those, we finally move off, and here we are going down the road. And you'll see that the, uh, on the left-hand side of the screen is the huntsman with the hounds, and there's a couple of people with him. They're referred to as whippers in, and they, they help the huntsman. Then there's two groups of riders. <clears throat> the, front, the front group is called the first field, the second group is the second field. So the front group, um, these people who are their better riders generally are more experienced horses. They're the ones who, when the hounds are chasing a coyote, they want to stay with the hounds. So they'll jump obstacles, including jumps we make, but other natural obstacles, go through ditches or streams or do whatever they can reasonably to stay with the hounds. 
The second group, um, uh, not as uh, not as adventurous, perhaps they might uh, be not as accomplished in the writing standpoint, or possibly they're on a green horse or both, and uh, or it's the first time out. You never know. But they they won't jump anything. They'll just walk, trot, canter, and maybe gallop a little bit. And often there's a third group, and that's the walk, trot group for people who, again, for whatever reason, um, decide that they want to go slowly and not do anything too adventurous. In front of each of these groups, so in the, the group to the right, the, the person in front, the one with the, uh, with the red jacket on, um, so that's the, the leader of that group, the field master, and so those people follow that person, absolutely follow that person. They never get in front of that person, and they have to follow that person. And the group in front has another person who does that, so that we have control of the riders out there during the day when we're riding across all these farms that we get permission on. So we're um, going down the road there, and the purpose of going down the road is to go to the first place where the huntsman thinks there's a coyote. That could be a piece of wood or a cornfield or any place in the area. This is one of our whippers in. And they help control the hound, help the huntsmen control the hounds, and um, in, they look after road safety. So if there's a road in the way, they get on the road and watch the traffic. They, we carry radios so that we're in communication with um, the huntsmen, the whippers in, and the field masters. And then we usually have one or two people in vehicles, so that they have radios too, so that if necessary, we can get to roads quickly. Now, we're just still on that way to the, the first place, the first drawer, as we call it, where we think we're going to look for a coyote. And there's a <clears throat> in this location, there was a farmer who just finished some work in the field behind on the way out. This is the local landowner and one of our members. Uh, this guy came out on his golf cart and managed to get it stuck. That caused a bit of a problem for us. But um, Here we are with the, the group on the way to that first drawer. Um, with the field master in front and the other people behind following. And going the cross country again. Now these photos come from you know, many, many different days out and uh, not all with our hunt either, but I've tried to piece them together to give you an idea of what, what the days are like. So here we have got to the first bit of wood where we think we're gonna find a coyote. <clears throat> the huntsman, the guy in front, has put the hounds, the hounds are not visible here, they're in the wood behind the horses. So they're in there looking for a coyote. The huntsman is walking down the edge of the wood slowly, and he makes a noise from time to time so that the hounds can hear him and stay in touch with him. Kind of like when you let your house dog out at night, every now and again, if you don't hear it, you might make a noise to see, so it'll stay in touch with you and come back. So they would draw down through that wood and it could take five or 10 minutes, it could take half an hour, it just depends on the size of the wood. The field is behind, that's the group of riders behind, that's the first field, and the person in the red coat there is probably the field master in this instance. So they, they, fought, they stay close to the field master for many reasons, for uh, usually um, feel, um, arable fields like this for crop reasons, so that if there are crops in the ground, that type of thing, they go single file around the edge of it. So, for purposes of this story, we didn't find a coyote in that wood. So here's the huntsman with his back to you, blowing the horn, collecting the hounds. So this is like, you know, when you let your dog go again uh, in the evening and you call for it, if you have a whistle, you whistle for it, they'll come back to it. Um, and these hounds will come to this horn, uh, providing they're not actually hunting, they'll come to this horn from as far away as three quarters of a mile, providing they can hear it. So obviously further downwind than upwind, but. So we collect all the hounds and then we carry on across this field to the next place where the huntsman thinks we might find a coyote. The field in the meantime is collected. Now they stay far enough away from the hounds so that the, they, the horses, especially if they are new horses out, they don't, they don't mingle with the hounds so it minimizes the chance of a hound getting kicked, which is one thing that's very frowned on. <coughs> Here we're crossing a, a field on the way, probably on the way to that wood in the background, and we've got three people helping here, three whippers in, one on the right, on the gray, one on the left, and one at the back, and the huntsman in the middle with the hounds. So the next, uh, the next, yeah, again, for purposes of this story, the next place we were looking for a coyote is in this cornfield on the left. So cornfields are a common place on warm days for coyotes to hang out because it's, uh, it's sheltered, 
and it's cool. So we, we hack down the side of this cornfield <clears throat> to the back, and then the hounds are put into the cornfield, and we draw back towards us. And here you can see several of the hounds out in the open, with the rest of the pack being to, the, to your left in the corn. <clears throat> and the field is in two groups again, coming along behind the huntsman, following, waiting for that magical moment when one of the hounds barks, speaks as we call it, which is when they smell the coyote. As soon as, they, as soon as they speak and bark, then the other hounds go to that hound uh, because they want a piece of the action too. They want to be in on the smelling of the coyote. And then the, the hounds start to trail the coyote by scent. Here they are in a typical field when they, there's a, the, the line of the coyote where the coyote walked or ran across leaves the scent behind. These hounds are smelling that scent and the riders are behind there. Now this, they can do that very quickly or very slowly, depending on the scenting conditions. So on a really good scenting day, they can go flat out. But on a poor scenting day, it might be at walking pace. So it varies a lot. And it's a lot of fun watching hounds um, working as a pack and figuring out where this has gone. That's the part of it that I like. A lot of people enjoy that too. In this picture, the, a coyote has been viewed by somebody else. This was up in... Uh, up near Grand Valley, and a coyote was viewed going off to the right. The huntsman's called the hounds out. He's blowing the horn there a bit, and you can see the front hounds are pushing forward. They can smell the coyote, and in this one, there's a hound further to the right, or two or three hounds speaking on the line, barking on the line, and these hounds can hear that and are running to it to get to it. They want to be up front with those other hounds. In fact, that one on the left, you can see jumping up to have a look so he can see the hounds in front. The huntsman at this point is relaxed, is sitting there, letting the hounds get up and settled on the line of the coyote, so there's a pack they can work out where the coyote's gone. <clears throat> this is a picture that, uh, it, it's, it was a very small photo, but it's a good one, and I, it's, unfortunately it's blurry because it's blown up, but these hounds are going flat out in full cry. They've been running for some time, obviously, because they're spread out, and they're going from left to right, there's the field behind. The huntsman's probably off to the right somewhere, up with the lead hounds. There's the huntsman with the hounds. Uh, again, those hounds are running hard, um, and you can't see in this, but they, they're, they're making a lot of noise. They're barking as much as they can. It's quite remarkable these hounds will run, you know, for an hour or two at a time sometimes, flat out and bark every other step. It's amazing how they do it. This is the field, keeping up. Um, field master in front, field behind. Uh, they are pressing on, trying to keep up with the hounds. So they'll view the hounds, but mostly they keep up by listening to them, to the cry of the pack, the barking of them as a collective group. <clears throat> More field, keeping up, and of course, whether it rains, it's rain or shine or snowing, whatever, we, it has to be pretty bad for us not to go. So a bit of rain doesn't bother people. There's the field again trying to keep up. And here they are, they're going around the edge of a field. Now this, there's a reason they're going around the edge of that field. It's probably wet, and it's probably an alfalfa field, so the farmer likely doesn't want us riding across it. So we go around the edge of it. That seems to work for most people. <clears throat> it's the field again catching up. <laughs> people, when the hounds are running and they're following them, people, they get these phenomenal smiles on their faces. It is a lot of fun. And this horse, you'll, this person's obviously having fun, but this horse you'll note is, is very focused ahead. And you'll, um, some, not all horses, but a lot of horses um, become very attached to the cry of the hounds. As soon as the hounds start speaking, they are just absolutely focused on them and want to be with them. So especially hounds, uh, horses that hunt a lot, they get very like that. So in this picture, um, Let's pretend that in that cornfield, that coyote they were chasing, they chased it, they chased it into this, this cornfield. Obviously, this is earlier in the season, but... So this, this two or three photos here were taken by this lady, Gretchen Pelham, who's a phenomenal photo photographer. But on the bottom left, you can see a coyote there. So he's just... He's run through the corn. The hounds are in there, chasing him out. That's the huntsman. He's standing there waiting for them to see what, which way they'll go out of the corn. Coyote pops out. Jams on the brakes, has a quick look. He says, yikes, there's a hound, and there's the huntsman. Big pun? 
I can, yeah. This is the coyote. Okay. Thank you. That's the hound. That's the huntsman. So the, um, and that hound was, um, would have been following the line of that coyote up through the corn. And the coyote's ahead. And this coyote decided, OK, you know, I'm going to go for it, because there would have been other hounds behind. So you know, you have to keep going. So he heads off out of town. And the hounds, this is a full cry picture. So these hounds have, uh, are chasing the, on the center of the coyote, running after it. See that one hound at the back? That's got the number 17 on it. That was uh, the, they, we have uh, performance trials, they call them, where you, several hunts get together and bring a few hounds each. And um, I was at one in Tennessee a couple of weeks ago. And they put numbers on them, and they put them in one group and hunt them all together. And then they have judges to figure out kind of who, who wins the day, have a series of these, and then winners at the end of the year, just like many sports. <clears throat> This shot is, uh, it's a little shot. It's quite a good shot. This is the coyote. There's a little brown smudge there. And that's the lead hound in front of the pack. And so for purposes of this story, they chase this coyote for a while, and then they lose it. And that probably 90% of the time, that's what happens. They catch a few coyotes, but. Most of the time they lose it because the coyote runs out of the country where we have permission or because um, the scenting isn't good enough. That's a common one. They just, the scent, uh, they get across, say, a field where they've been sheep or, say, uh, livestock of some type that interferes with the scent of the coyote and they can't hunt through that scent. So that causes the, the hunt, that hunt to end. So <clears throat> the field at that point gather up in this case, uh, here's, here's the huntsman gathering the hounds. So he's blowing the hounds. And uh, I didn't notice at that point, actually, but the, this horse was tagging along behind because the person on it had fallen off about 10 minutes before. Yeah, so, so gather the hounds up and then um, get them all together and uh, <clears throat> head back to, usually, um, it depends on the time. We're usually out for two or three hours during a day, sometimes three or four hours, it depends. At the end of that, uh, imaginary chase there, we might then decide to go to another wood and try and find another coyote. Depends on the time and the amount of uh, country that we have permission in to, to cross. Otherwise, we head back to the trailers and, and that, that day would be over. So the, that's a typical sort of uh, hunting day, if you like. And afterwards, we usually go to a local restaurant or in the, uh, in the fall season from the middle of September to the end of November, we have evening parties and dinners at people's houses usually, which is always good fun. The social side of it is probably as much fun as the hunting. <clears throat> Hounds are a big part of hunting, and um, you know, the, uh, the breeding of the hounds is very carefully uh, looked after. The, the governing body for um, riding to hounds is the Masters of Foxhounds Association in Virginia. They maintain a database. There's around 80,000 hounds in that. So you can take the lineage of any of those hounds, that, say the hounds in our pack, and go back maybe 10 or 15 or 20 generations and see who the parents were, figure out who you want to breed to so that you'll have the best hounds for hunting five years down the road. So we have just a few shots of hounds. <clears throat> this is an English hound called Godfrey. And uh, he's a very good hunting hound. Just Got a good picture of him. This lady, Karen McDonald, takes a lot of photos for her hunt. She is, does a great job. <clears throat> this is a crossbred hound. So that's an English hound crossed with, uh, with an American hound. That on the English side, he's got some Welsh blood in, and that's where he gets the woolly coat from. Because all Welsh hounds have woolly coats. <clears throat> that's a hound looking for a biscuit in the huntsman's pocket. That's the same Welsh hound, Leroy. <clears throat> it's another English hound. It's a hound called Gilly, very, um, a very good hunting hound, and uh, we, we've used her to breed from. So there are many different types of, uh, of hounds. Um, you know, from a kennel perspective, you've got the foxhound as a breed, then you've got English and American and Penn Merrydale hounds, and on the English side, you've got several types of English hounds and several types of American hounds. 
<clears throat> so they all get interbred over the years, depending on uh, how well they hunt. But they're all wor working hounds. That's the important thing. So aside from hunting, we have every year we have a puppy show. So we have two or three litters that are born every year, and they're usually born between kind of December and March. And uh, then the following year, um, say they're born in March of 2.17 and March of 2.18, <clears throat> uh, or June of 2.18, we'll have a puppy show. So we set a ring up. It's kind of like a little dog show for puppies. The purpose is to judge the puppies, to come up with the best puppies. So we invite a couple of judges. The judges are on the left uh, with the blue suit inside the ring. The huntsman's in the white jacket, and the hounds, those puppies are being judged. So we have that sheet of plywood on the ground so they can stand up so you can see their feet properly because the quality of a hound's feet is very important if they're going to travel typical 20 or 25 miles a day. They need good feet to, make, to, to have a uh, reasonable lifespan hunting. Here they are standing up on the, uh, on the piece of wood. The huntsman's got a biscuit in his hand. He's getting their attention so the judges can see them and judge them against each other and figure out which ones they think are the best. <clears throat> so the guy pointing there in the blue suit, he's a professional huntsman. He's now down in the States, and uh, he's a very experienced guy. So he's discussing some point of etiquette or of, uh, of uh, confirmation that, uh, in, the, in the hounds. These people are puppy walkers, so um, when the puppies are born, usually about uh, when they're a couple of weeks after their welt, people in the hunt agree to take a pair of them and walk them for three or four months, which means they take them home with them and keep them. And they teach them uh, their name and to go on a lead and to be sort of uh, social, uh, to get used to horses and farm animals if there's some around, and cars and tractors if there's some around, just to generally get used to life outside the kennel. Then after three or four months, they come back into the kennel and they live there the rest of their life there. So the pu part of the purpose of the puppy show is so the puppy walkers get a chance to show off their puppies. So these two ladies have <clears throat> had a pair each and uh, they're showing them and there'll be um, probably another two or three pairs in that ring competing against each other. So these two, <clears throat> these two are up here. Their particular reason there, they probably made it to the final. You see the one on the right. It may be the way it's standing, but it's front right, front left foot. You can see it's turned in a bit. That's not. It may be just standing that way, but that's a that's a fault in it because it's a confirmation fault. Which, if it's traveling 20 miles with a foot turned in like that, you can see it's not going to last as long as one that's got straight feet and it's well put together, just like any other animal. There's another puppy walker. When the puppy show's finished, then uh, generally we put, let all the hounds out and out of the kennel and uh, put them in the ring. And the huntsman goes in there and tosses them a few biscuits and people look at them. It is pouring with rain here, so there aren't that many people there. But um, so, And that's the annual puppy show. And afterwards we have a, a tea and the, it's a bit of a competition to see who can make the snappiest looking tea sandwiches and stuff. It's kind of fun. I like a drink personally, but... <clears throat> So one of the other things we do is each year for the last um, uh, six or seven years, we have done a hound parade in Elora, and uh, the purpose of that is to raise money for the Groves Hospital. <coughs> so people, I can't believe how many people come to watch this. It's quite incredible. <coughs> but basically, we go down there with a bunch of hounds, and we parade them through the main street. And we usually have about 20 or 30 riders Everybody gets very dressed up because the pomp and circumstance is what it's about on this day. On hunt days, people aren't that concerned about it. <clears throat> this is um, uh, a lady who comes out hunting, Kim Merrill. I don't know if any of you know her, but her, her father, Frank Merrill, was one of Canada's best-known uh, racing trainers, racehorse trainers. He, uh, <clears throat> so she, she comes out side saddle, and um, there's a local well-known family that have um, heavy horses, and they bring theirs out and put those in the parade. That's always kind of fun. There's another member side saddle. And um, the town of Elora made uh, this first or second year we did this, they made this video. We didn't know they were doing it, but they did. I just thought it might be fun to show it. It's only two minutes long, so probably won't put you to sleep.
There is, yeah. further down here. Yeah. There we go. So in the, after the season's finished in, um, for most of the hunting folks in December, they just take the shoes off the horses and turn them out. That's, that's what I do. So I don't, really, I don't really ride much except when I'm hunting. <clears throat> Quite a few of our members, though, um, in the summer, in between, we have a little season in the springtime, too. But we have June and July and the first two weeks in August when uh, we're not doing anything except puppy shows and hound shows. So we have a series of summer rides and so we organize riding cross country through a lot of the country that we hunt through. And uh, that's very popular, people have a great time. <coughs> Barbecues afterwards and you know that sort of thing. It's, <coughs> it's a nice way to spend time in the summertime if, if you like, you know, if you're out riding and enjoy it. That was in the I think that's in the Monocliffs Park in one of the ponds there. <clears throat> this is up near, um, up near Shelburne at a member's house. So lots of get-togethers and social stuff going on. We, uh, we've had art classes where you paint by the number. You can tell there's no one very talented here. <clears throat> we have a book club that's quite popular. It's not a big group, but 10 or 15 people who visit tremendous literature surrounding hunting. There are thousands of books that have been written on the topic that go back a long way, and some of them, some of them are technical about hunting, but uh, a lot of them are um, uh, very good reading. They're well written and funny, and uh, all f full of stories about country life and living, you know, living out in the countryside. It's, uh, there's a great literature around fox hunting, and there's a lot of poetry as well um, by guys like Will Ogilvy and um, John Macefield, people poet laureate for the UK. People like that. So it, the book club's quite popular. And um, we've, uh, we've had lots of things. Uh, th I mean, this fall, we, uh, we had a guy in this. don't know if anyone's run across him, Alexis, before, but he's a naturalist. He did a seminar on uh, tracking for us. And so we go out and look at tracks in the snow or in, in, the, in the mud and riverbanks, that kind of thing, and, and figure out what's been there and why it's been there and how it lives and how it relates to the, so all kind of peripherally related to hunting. 
So there's a lot of other things we do aside from hunting on the social side, and lots of people enjoy that. So, yeah. So that's about the end of my presentation. I don't know if anyone has any questions, but I can try and answer them if they do. Oh, the last. Okay, the pictures are just amazing. Good. They're, they're yeah. just uh, congratulations on that. And it, is uh, are the social ends and the summer rides are they open to anyone or just members? No, they're they're open to anybody. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah, we're a pretty welcoming crowd, and we like to have fun. That's really what it's about. Yeah. <laughs> Having fun. Yeah. Well, it, it so. was it was really great. Thank I, you. I, I should say I didn't take one of those photos. <laughs> Although, <laughs> oh, you know, I didn't, I didn't bring a horn, sorry. I should have, maybe. Yeah, I didn't, no, I didn't. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Well, thank you very much, folks.